Welcome back to New World Next Week. I'm James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. And I'm James Evan Pilato for MediaMonarchy.com, spraying and spying on friend and foe alike. We've got that story plus the deflated Venezuela coup. But first, really important, just kind of, I think, landmark work coming from Whitney Webb. Newly released FBI docs shed 9-11 light on dancing Israelis. For nearly two decades, one of the most overlooked and little-known arrests made in the aftermath of September 11th was that of the so-called high-fivers or the dancing Israelis. New information released by the FBI on May 7th brought fresh scrutiny to the possibility that the dancing Israelis, at least two of whom are known Mossad operatives, had prior knowledge of the attacks on the World Trade Center. Shortly after 8.46 a.m. on the day of the attacks, just minutes after the first plane struck the World Trade Center, five men, later revealed to be Israeli nationals, had positioned themselves in the parking lot of the Doric apartment complex in Union City, New Jersey, where they were seen taking pictures and filming the attacks while also celebrating the destruction of the towers and high-fiving each other. At least one eyewitness interviewed by the FBI had seen the Israelis van in the parking lot as early as 8 o'clock that morning, more than 40 minutes prior to the start of the attacks. The story received coverage in U.S. mainstream media at the time, but has since pretty much largely been forgotten. The men, Sivan Kurzberg, Paul Kurzberg, Oded Elner, Yaron Shimoyel, and Omar Marmari, were subsequently apprehended later that day by law enforcement, claimed to be Israeli tourists on a working holiday in the United States where they employed by a moving company, Urban Moving Systems. Upon his arrest, Sivan Kurzberg told the arresting officer, quote, we are Israeli, we are not your problem. Your problems are our problems. The Palestinians are the problem, end quote. For years, the official story has been that these individuals, while they had engaged in immature behavior by celebrating and being visibly happy in documenting the attacks, they had no prior knowledge of the attack. However, newly released FBI copies of photos taken by those five Israelis, as they confiscated all their stuff, Strongly suggest that these individuals had prior knowledge of the attacks on the World Trade Center. This long must-read article by Whitney Webb includes the part that some of the photos show the date as September 10th, 2001. Copies of the photos were obtained via a FOIA request made by a private citizen. According to former high-ranking American Intel official who spoke to the Jewish Daily Forward in 2002, the FBI concluded in its investigation that the five Israelis arrested, quote, were conducting a Mossad surveillance mission and that their employer, Urban Moving Systems of Weehawken, New Jersey, served as a front, end quote. At least two of the men arrested were determined to have direct links to the Mossad after their names appeared in a CIA-FBI database of foreign intelligence operatives. According to one of their lawyers, one of the men, Paul Kurzberg, had previously worked for the Mossad in another country prior to arriving in America. Another of those arrested, Oded Elner, subsequently stated on Israeli TV that the five Israelis had been in New York at the time to document the event, meaning the attack on the World Trade Center. The FOIA release of these photos is notable because the responses to prior FOIA requests to the Department of Justice, which oversees the FBI, had previously claimed that all the photos taken by Israeli nationals had been destroyed in January 2014. The photos themselves are very heavily redacted, black and white, with big marks, you know, squares blocking out the faces making it impossible to see their facial expressions. However, previously declassified yet highly redacted FBI reports state that the Israelis are visibly happy in nearly every photo, even when the burning towers are in the background. The photos released are also not original copies and instead to be photocopies of photocopies of the original pictures. In addition of the original 76 pictures developed by authorities from the camera in the Israelis' possession, 14 of these have been released. The PDF, FOIA release of 9-11 dancing Israelis through the FBI, will, of course, be included in our show notes. I think it's also important to include the source at the complete 9-11 timeline. Very well-sourced entry, 3.56 p.m., September 11, 2001, five apparent Israeli spies arrested for puzzling behavior at time of first World Trade Center attack. James, I know that is epic, but I think it's kind of really important here in just the work that we've done in nearly a decade on New World Next Week and our own respective shows to kind of put this kind of, I, I think, you know, new information on the record. I, I would also note you could have included this on your latest five conspiracy theories that turned out to be true, hey? I certainly could have, to be fair, along with about a million other stories, but this is certainly one of those. And uh, I think it is important that we do highlight these new pictures or the very old pictures that have been released finally in this heavily redacted state, but 
Please note a couple of things. First of all, these are not all the pictures. There were 76 pictures. These are only 10 of them. So there's another several dozen pictures that uh, we haven't even seen copies of copies of copies of copies of. And another thing, once you do go and look at these pictures, as I trust the viewers out there will do, uh, please do look at them for yourselves and you will see that they are not only outright redacted with squares over faces and what have you, although we can work out who is who get based on descriptions from the FBI reports and things like that. But uh, also, uh, I mean, the towers themselves aren't visible in these copies of copies of copies. Is it because they black actually redacted them out? Or is it because the copies aren't showing the, the part of the photograph that has the... I mean, there's so many... These are just... A contextless, these are almost meaningless. If you just saw these pictures and didn't know anything about the context of them, you would have no idea what this relates to or why they're important, which is why the actual story is important. And I will humbly beseech people to go and check back on my 9-11 Suspects Dancing Israelis video. It's under 20 minutes and it goes through all of the information about who these guys were and what we know and from what documents and it sources it all. So I will point people to that. I'll put the show no uh, link in the show notes for people to check out if you're not familiar with this story. This isn't the smoking gun of 9-11, but it is an important event that often gets misinterpreted by people like Trump. Oh, there were Arab Pal Palestinians cheering across the Hudson River. Nope. No, there were Israelis cheering and photographing themselves, celebrating the events. That's a pretty important mistake for the dissembler-in-chief to make, isn't it? And pretty telling, uh, given his support for Netanyahu, who, let's be reminded, did say that 9-11 was good for Israel. Uh, again, many, many things to go into here, but uh, please follow the link to 9-11 Suspects Dancing Israelis, where a lot of this is covered in great detail. If my guess, if I had to guess, it seems like the the photocopies of photocopies of photocopies, they're just so blown out that anything in the in the far background has just kind of been obliterated from from, you know, the contrast. That's my guess. Our second story on this long awaited return of Neural Next Week. I believe this is episode 373 by my count. I think in a lot of ways on this episode, James, we're just trying to, to kind of catch up in, in a way as we've taken most of May off. To catch up on stories that that are important that we have been following and to kind of keep, you know, keep keep the story going, as it were. After opposition support deflated U.S. targets Venezuela food. So the hot air figures that Moon of Alabama talks about, and again, everything that we mention will always be included in the show notes. Hot air figures the U.S. used for its regime change efforts in Venezuela failed to do their job. The New York Times declares their movement deflated, and then 11 hours after they published that story, they kind of altered the headline and removed the word deflated. It still repeats the full propaganda claims that makes clear that Guaido is lacking public support, as we've pretty much known. This change is a turning point for the opposition, which since January had gathered momentum, attracting broad international backing and huge crowds of supporters. Now that momentum has nearly dissipated, a testament to Maduro's firm hold on power, even as the country pretty much crumbles all around him. The government of Venezuela is talking with some opposition parties. There is no confirmation yet that Guaido's party, which is the most radical opposition element, is actually involved, as the, the New York Times would sort of imply. It's doubtful that the government would want to negotiate with it. Interestingly, the New York Times leaves out the false interim president attribute that it's so previously often used to describe Guaido. It's interesting, again, to just kind of watch how so quickly the language changes, the, the metrics of the situations all change. That Guaido failed with his clownish coup attempt does not mean that the U.S. will give up on its regime change efforts. Remember, it takes two wings to make this fascist bird fly. December 18th, 2014, Obama signs off on sanctions against Venezuela because they all work together. The Trump administration, of course, is now joining the opposition effort to increase the number of people in Venezuela who go hungry prepping more sanctions and criminal charges against Venezuelan officials and others suspected of using a military-run food aid program to launder money for Maduro's government. James, I've been listening a lot lately to Ryan Christian at The Last American Vagabond, and he's been covering this story just really day in, day out. Now, I'll point folks in that direction, but I think it's just really interesting that just as the moment it seems that the Venezuelan coup kind of falls apart— and you'll know it because it stops being just blasted at you constantly. Now the war machine is switched. And now what is it? Iran back on the front burner, James? It seems that way. 
Um, it's an interesting turn of events, isn't it? I mean, a couple of months ago, we could have predicted this turning out very differently than it so far has, and there's a couple of things that perhaps we can speculate, at least, about um, regarding this, one of which is, this is so clownish. The entire ordeal in Venezuela and the way this has played out has been so haphazard and, and mishandled and, and ridiculous on its face that it makes you almost wonder. I mean, we do, I think, tend to build the powers that shouldn't be up in our mind into these all-seeing gods that can manipulate reality any way they wish, when in reality, no, they are bumbling idiots a lot of the time as well, so we shouldn't overestimate them. But this is just so clownish, so stupid, that one wonders how they thought this was ever going to happen. Um, which either means perhaps there's something more going on here, or... Perhaps this really does signal what a lot of people have been talking about in great detail. I know Pepe Escobar, for example, has been writing about this recently and others. The end of the American ability to project its empire around the world with impunity um, that we have seen, obviously, in the post-World War II era. Perhaps that this really is the beginning of that end that is coming. Uh, didn't work in Syria, not working in Venezuela. They've been trying with Iran for a decade plus now, at least, a decade and a half, and still, there's they're still ratcheting up, and there's a lot of war talk, but again, is it going to happen? And if so, I mean, how, how could that, how could an Iran invasion really work at this stage if they can't even th overthrow Maduro? I mean, it, it's, there's something really not adding up here, and I'd like to come away with the the happy idea, well, maybe, you know, Washington can't just go around and overthrow governments at, at will anymore, but maybe there's something deeper to this story. Anyway, with Bolton as national security advisor, uh, all bets are on the table for some sort of war before the 2020 selection cycle um, fin completes. So uh, I'm not I'm not holding my breath that it's all over now, but at any rate, there's something, there's a big roadblock that it seems to be taking place here, and I'm happy that that's happening, uh, but we'll have to see what how this plays out. That's well. That's a really. I mean, that's a really pithy way to to put it, James. It's like you guys think you're going to go after Iran and you can't even knock over Venezuela. It, so it's interesting. I think you know whether it's you know movies or sodas or whatever sort of popular uprising. There's a sort of art and a psychology to like the, to the building of these sorts of campaigns, and you can watch it again as as a media guy. You can watch it and go, oh well, you ah, you guys missed it. You, your 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 opportunity and your chance to sort of whip up all the sentiment, not only there but also especially here to kind of get people to not only tacitly go along with it but just you know cheerlead it as an ad, as an ad campaign. It's it, yeah, it's completely failed and fallen apart, and it's, it seems like that's why they've maybe moved on. Our third and final story this week on an important return of New World Next Week, Monsanto spied on both sides of pesticide debate in at least seven European nations. New details have emerged about their recently revealed dossiers, plural, Monsanto, now of course owned by Bayer. And James, I've kind of had this discussion in my chat and my show a little bit where folks have said, just stop saying Monsanto. It doesn't exist anymore. It's like saying Blackwater. You got to say Bayer. You got to talk about the names that are actually kind of running the show. And they, and they make an excellent point. I think that's a lot of the reason something like Monsanto had to go away, just like Blackwater. It's too dirty and too sloppy and it's no longer effective. New details have emerged about the recently revealed dossiers Monsanto, now owned by Bayer, compiled to sway public opinion on herbicides. The dossiers included people from seven European states and potentially beyond, according to further reports by RT. Monsanto files reportedly listed prominent public figures who were opinionated on either side of the herbicide debate. The list included stakeholders in Germany, Italy, Netherlands, Poland, Spain, and the United Kingdom, as well as regarding stakeholders related to EU institutions. Bayer was already being investigated for a couple of weeks by French prosecutors for compiling files of influential people such as journalists in France, Likely did the same across Europe, suggesting a potentially wider problem. 
French prosecutors said several weeks ago that they had opened an inquiry after newspaper Le Mans filed a complaint alleging that Monsanto, acquired by Bayer for $63 billion last year, had kept a file of 200 names, including journalists and lawmakers, in hopes of influencing positions on pesticides. The list was said to be prepared by PR firm Fleischmann Hillard on behalf of Monsanto. The issue of the list, as many folks might be screaming at this show right now, pales in comparison to, of course, the legal liability Bayer potentially faces after losing its third trial and counting over claims that Roundup causes cancer. Monsanto spied on friends and foes to sway public opinion on GMO and herbicides. will of course, include the link to that new reportage by RT. So, James, I think, like I said on my morning show, like Nexium and Nixon... Eugenics-obsessed big pharma technocrats also have an enemies list. James? Yeah, that's that's a good way of putting it. Um, yeah, I, I, I will uh, cheer along with those people cheering at home or jeering. Um, of all of the legal difficulties that... Uh, and, and, and financial difficulties that uh, Bear Santo finds itself in right now, it seems to me that the fact that they kept a list of journalists would not rank up there as at the very top. I, I Granted, I'm not a lawyer in the EU bureaucracy monstrosity so what do i know but uh, keeping list name lists of names of journalists is illegal somehow i don't know it doesn't i don't even understand what legal um, restrictions there would be on such a thing but uh, obviously they're doing it to keep track of who's being naughty and who's being nice and who will play with us and who won't and you know we'll reward this guy over here and blah 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 play, play dirty tricks over here whatever they do i mean clearly that's why they would keep such a list but just keeping a list doesn't seem like it would be particularly legal anyway i'm just glad that it, things are not working out well for buyer it's technically pronounced buyer but i'm canadian so i'll say bear um bear santo um in fact if anything it's the reverse midas touch um ever since the the takeover has taken place it's uh, been nothing but bad news and in fact uh, fortune now reporting uh bear has now lost over 44 percent of its value since its monsanto merger and another recent headline, Bears management face a no confidence vote over Monsanto deal. deal. Um, so there, there's a lot of difficulties, including, of course, the continuing legal difficulties um, regarding Roundup and cancer and all of this and multi-billion dollar settlements that are being reached at this point. I mean, it's just it's insanity, um, which is good, because if you don't know why this is such a monstrosity and why Bear Santo must be opposed. Please go back and watch or rewatch episode 340 of the Bor Corporate Report podcast, Bear plus Monsanto equals a match made in hell, where I go through the history of these companies and what it, the merger of these companies means. And if this merger actually is successful, it's a very bad uh, thing for humanity because the combination of Big Pharma and Big Agra is not a road that we want to be going down. I my my speculation as far as the as far as the list goes is that the I think the real action wouldn't necessarily come from the enemies list. It might come from finding out who's on the friends list, and we find out, folks. Oh, look who's on you know maybe who's on the payroll. James, I'm actually going to take next week off of the Media Monarchy broadcast just to try and kind of catch up uh, behind the scenes. Uh, but regardless of that, generally speaking, I, I, I make news, music, memes, and more at MediaMonarchy.com. Been doing it for nearly 14 years. Never heard an ad, never heard a snake oil pitch. Would love folks to come check us out and support us. James. All right. Awesome. All right. Well, look, looking forward to talking to you again. Talk to you soon. Take care.